Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this very interesting and very timely webinar uh, that the Indian School of Business is organizing in partnership with the British Deputy High Commission here in Chandigarh. Uh, today, as you all know, is uh, Earth Day, uh, April 22nd. Uh, you know, days like this are, are are used as an occasion for all of us to sometimes repurpose and uh, think about issues that really matter. Uh, this year, uh, we decided to partner with the British High Commission to organize a panel discussion on climate change and its impact on agriculture. Uh, this is significant for more, more reasons than one. One, this is the year of COP26. In a few months from now, UK is hosting COP26 and there's a bunch of events and activities uh, that are sort of being organized in the run up to it for all participating countries to actually think of what should be the agenda and action plan going forward. There is also here with us uh, panelists who represent an important portfolio of agriculture from two states of Punjab and Haryana, uh, you know, states which are dom predominantly agrarian and therefore have a lot of important contributions to make. Uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Arvind Padi, who is the country director of ICRISAT here. And, uh, you know, as someone who spent time in the space, who will also uh, share his experiences. Uh, while we'll be joined by the fourth panelist, uh, and I will also just make a mention of my colleague, uh, Dr. Anjal Prakash, who is the research director at Bharti Institute, uh, who will moderate the discussion. I do want to welcome Ambassador Ken Flaherty, who is the regional director of the UK government uh, for COP26 for Asia Pacific and South Asia. Uh, so Ken, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and, you know, I know you've, uh, this is a role that you've taken a little over a year ago now, uh, from what I gather. And, uh, you know, Ken has, is, be, is a career officer of the Foreign Service and has previously served in Rome, Tokyo, and also has been in part of the representation to EU. Uh, so, Ken, we will we look forward to your uh, remarks. I also noticed that George has just joined. So, welcome, George. Uh, I to all my Indian colleagues uh, from the administrative service who are on the uh, you know call this afternoon, uh, belated uh, greetings and uh, expression of gratitude. Yesterday was Civil Services Day. Uh, it's a day that we all sort of use as an occasion to recognize and thank all of you uh, for the services that you rendered to this country. And uh, you know I think all of us are in full admiration of the work that you all do. So my sort of you know respects to all of you on this occasion. Uh, and, and I think with those few words, I do want to sort of now uh, invite Ambassador Ken O'Flaherty to, uh, you know, for your remarks. And after that, uh, we'll just move over to the panel discussion. Over to you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you today. Happy Earth Day and to all our panelists and um, those watching. Um, so I would start by saying we are currently at a critical juncture. Um, humanity is facing twin threats of climate change and biodiversity loss. The two are inextricably linked and they do need to be tackled together urgently and with equal ambition. In 2015, world leaders committed in Paris to a historic agreement to tackle global climate change. They agreed to keep global mean temperature rises well below 2 degrees Celsius and to strive to limit the rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Both India and the UK are proud signatories of that Paris Agreement. Now, as you may already know, the UK is hosting the UN COP26 later this year in Glasgow, when leaders worldwide will come together to take action to tackle climate change. The UK is seeking to use our COP26 presidency to build on the foundations led at the 2019 UN Climate Action Summit, and we want to be working with governments, with businesses and civic organisations worldwide to raise climate ambition. We must tackle the drivers of climate change and biodiversity loss. We want to mobilize financing to protect and restore critical ecosystems and kickstart a just rural transition towards sustainable land use, which will benefit people, climate and nature. We want to build momentum of efforts to shape policies, innovation and investment for in transitions to sustainable agriculture, improving food, water and economic security. Now, agriculture is one of the most vulnerable sectors to the impacts of climate change, as well as the fourth highest greenhouse gas emitting sector globally. 
Studies have shown that the largest known economic impact of climate change is upon agriculture because of the size and the sensitivity of that sector. Changes in temperature and rail rainfall, shifting pests and diseases, and increasingly frequent extreme weather events will affect, and indeed are affecting today, food production and security globally. So I'd like to use this platform to talk a bit about how the UK is transforming our agricultural sector to make it climate smart, and how we can strengthen UK-India collaboration to de develop the cutting edge technology we all need to build a green, resilient and prosperous future. So what's the UK doing? We are taking bold action on climate. We have nearly halved emissions over the last 20 years while growing our economy by 75% at the same time. These emissions reductions have largely been delivered by decarbonizing our power sector. But to meet our commitment to go to net zero emissions by 2050, we have to transform every sector of our economy, including agriculture. To do this, we're going to need to harness the power of business and innovation. We have taken advice from our independent Committee for Climate Change on how agriculture needs to change in order to be climate smart. That's likely to include greater use of trees on farms, low carbon approaches on how we use fertilizer and raise livestock, encouraging bioenergy crops, reducing food waste and consumption of the most carbon intensive foods. We believe that this will be good for our people and it will be good for the planet. UK farmers, researchers, businesses are all developing and adapting innovative agricultural practices for tackling climate change. For example, Scientists in the UK are developing small battery powered robots that could drastically cut tractor use and thereby diesel use, which is a large source of carbon emissions in farming. Drones are also increasingly being used in the UK to help farmers work out the exact patterns of moisture, weeds and pests. Mapping and analysing each field allows farmers to be targeting nitrogen fertiliser in only those places where it's needed at the right time and thereby cut their emissions. Businesses have shown that a green economy isn't just good for the environment, it's also good for their bottom line. Being green can be profitable. So if I can turn now to UK-India collaboration. Aimed at developing the opportunity for such collaboration, the DIT Agritech team has appointed a University of Birmingham-led consortium of industry experts to deliver a feasibility report for the UK to successfully partner with India to set up a centre of excellence in post-harvest management in Haryana. The centre of excellence will be an integrated site demonstrating end-to-end -end UK capabilities in post-harvest management and logistics with energy efficient, low carbon and sustainable technologies. The UK is home to world class agricultural research in areas such as plant and animal breeding, remote sensing, meteorological prediction and the exploitation of data. When coupled with India's large agricultural research system and skilled human power, these have resulted in initiation of several joint collaborative research projects. These projects deal with critical issues of increasing crop productivity, improving livestock health, exploiting genomics for crop improvement, sustainable management of aquaculture systems, effective management of nitrogen use in agriculture, and reducing post-harvest losses in India. Some of these jointly funded projects have also investigated ways to improve the disease resistant and stress tolerance of staple crops and they have led to developing crop varieties that are suitable for a changing climate and producing more food with fewer inputs. Because of these joint programmes, the UK is now India's largest international partner in biotechnology research. Agriculture could be more resistant to and resilient to climate change impacts through new technology or by diversifying different crops on farms. So I'm excited to see how we can work together on this agenda of creating climate smart agriculture. The commitment of both our governments means that the UK and India are natural partners in acting on climate. We can be a joint force for good worldwide. We want to work even closer with India to help us mobilize that global action at COP26.
that will mean driving action on priority themes like improving adaptation and resilience and harnessing nature and biodiversity. I very much look forward to hearing the views of the experts on this panel today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Flaherty, for those remarks and also uh, for touching upon the UK-India relationship, which we all, uh, you know, sort of uh, call the hashtag living bridge. Uh, it's only unfortunate because of the current pandemic uh, situation in India that the Prime Minister's visit has been called off, but that I'm sure would have added further momentum to our relationship. Uh, notwithstanding the cancellation of the visit, I'm sure engagements like this will further strengthen uh, you know, partnerships in some of these areas, especially in agriculture, as you specifically mentioned, and we have, you know, the, all the relevant leaders uh, from these very important states who are here who can take this forward. And, you know, as a school, ISB is happy to participate as well. Uh, with those few words, I want to thank you again for your remarks and uh, Anjal, over to you. Uh, thanks, Guru, and thanks, Ken, for a nice overview of the uh, situation we are in and also looking at um, how UK and India are working together to solve this problem. And let me just uh, uh, cross over and uh, first introduce my panel today. The um, uh, panel includes uh, very eminent uh, uh, personalities and I'm very happy uh, to coordinate this today. Uh, we start with uh, Sri Anirudh Tiwari. He is an IS officer, um, additional chief secretary, uh, agriculture and horticulture and food processing from government of Punjab. Welcome Anirudh. Uh, next is uh, Sumita Mishra. Um, Sumita is uh, also an IS officer and she's also additional chief secretary, agriculture, farmers, welfare department, government of Haryana. Welcome Sumita on board. Uh, Arvinda uh, Kumar Padi, uh, he's a uh, director of country relations and business affairs of uh, Equisat, New Delhi. Welcome Arvinda on board. We also have uh, Georges Felix, who's assistant professor, uh, department, uh, Center for um, Agroecology, Water and Resilience, Coventry University from UK. So very eminent for a panel. Let me just start with a few uh, data that, uh, you know, my engagement uh, with IPCC uh, uh, work that I've been doing, um, showing a couple of uh, reports which has come out from IPCC. And the most recent one in 2019 uh, is on uh, impact of climate change on, on uh, land. And, uh, you know, the report actually shows how climate change uh, is uh, uh, in, going to impact the uh, agriculture sector through water resources. These are the most impacting sectors. At the same time, it is also contributing to ch a changing climate. And that's something that uh, is worrisome. Um, the figures show that about 23% of the global human was greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, forestry and other land uses. And uh, this uh, about traditionally about 44% of the recent human driven methane, uh, potent greenhouse gas come from agriculture. At the same time, the agriculture is very uh, is climate dependent and it is actually susceptible to changing climate. And um, if you see the uh, in the condition of India, we see that a uh, huge number of population, especially about 60% of people directly dependent on agriculture. So I have, um, uh, I start with this panel, which let me just go over to uh, the format of this panel is that we'll get an opening remark from each of the panelists, followed by uh, uh, participants who will be asking questions, so we'll make it, make it more conversational and trying to reach to a uh, um, uh, kind of point where we have some agreement on uh, different aspects of um, climate change impacting on agriculture. So let me start with uh, George's. Um, George's, uh, over to you first for your opening remark. Thank you, Anjal. Thank you, everybody. Uh, very happy to share uh, some experiences with you, some views. Um, I'm a researcher based in the UK, but I have uh, I am originally from the Caribbean and I have uh, quite some experience in West Africa and Europe. And briefly, I would like to share you know, the, some of the views around the impact of climate change on agriculture. Um, these impacts include ecological, economic, social, political aspects, right, that can be exacerbated by the changes of the climate and 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 some examples are for example more frequent storms or cyclones in the caribbean we have more hurricanes more frequent and and uh, more devastating <clears throat> extreme climate events also droughts can be a problem extended droughts and droughts in seasons where it's supposed to be raining so um, 
this impacts, of course, the, the water uptake of the crops and the animals. Um, and also uh, other examples can include, you know, increased uh, events of pests. So there's a, an, an issue of uh, pest management and, and plant diseases, um, whether it's more because of more humidity in the air or uh, more, more uh, dry. Um, another point I wanted to, to raise is that, yeah, climate change is uh, often cited as the main problem. But in fact, there are other problems that are affecting global issues, including, for example, biogeochemical nutrient imbalances and uh, the, by, the biosphere integrity. And by, by integrity, I mean this uh, equilibrium, this uh, really uh, subtle equilibriums and interactions that occur in natural ecosystems that we have lost in highly intensive uh, and oversimplified farming systems. So this has led to these monocultures, for example, where we shift from a natural forest, we, we cut down and we, and we bring it down to a, a single crop, a single species a monoculture, um, can in, induce um, the use of more technology, uh, more pesticides, more herbicides, more uh, insecticides in order to control and replace the functions that biology has um, uh, naturally. Um, so this, of course, this uh, the evident erosion of diversity, uh, which is reflected above ground and below ground. So we're losing our, as well as uh, soil uh, biological diversity. And, uh, and not only that, we're also losing sediments and nutrients. So there's, a, there's an important uh, effect or consequence on, on nutrient losses, which can be, uh, there are strategies to, to control it. Um, another point um, is the, the, the pollution, which I've already mentioned, and the water management of the system. So we are, we are tapping into deeper groundwater reserves to in order to, to, to irrigate our crops and uh, we are depleting this, this precious resource. Um, and last but not least, in terms, and maybe it's not directly linked to climate change, but has a, a big impact on farming families and livelihoods, is that the, the problem of, of hunger in the world is not necessarily productivity, but rather an issue of distribution. So, um, uh, from the supermarkets, there is plenty of, of food that is gone to waste and, and, and it's not necessarily uh, uh, a, a, good, a good thing that is happening. So re rethinking these distribution systems and um, making more equitable access to, to food uh, items is also a very important um, element. And I will finish with this. Uh, some of the solutions to climate change is also uh, hearing out the people that are farming and reinforcing the farmer innovations that are taking place in our rural and urban areas and, and, and supporting with appropriate policies the claims of uh, farming families. Uh, this is crucial because without farmer, there is no food. So they are the main important actor, even more important than the technicians. And sometimes we forget this. So this is a call also for humbleness uh, with our with our peers and our collaborators. Thank you. Thanks, George. Okay. Thanks, George. It's very, very interesting overview. And also giving us a perspective from the Global South, uh, which is uh, important. And we see a lot of similarities between India and the inf uh, information that you shared. Uh, let me just go over to my friend Abinda Padi. And uh, Abinda is heading uh, is the director uh, with um, uh, Ikrisat and um, uh, you know has been researching on these issues for a lot for a quite long time. So I've been over to you for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Anjal. Uh, I think I'm audible there. Okay, yeah, you're audible. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Anjal. Uh, and uh, let me at the outset uh, express my sincere thanks to the British uh, Deputy High Commissioner at Chandigarh and the ISB for uh, choosing a very relevant topic uh, for the discussion. Uh, as you told, uh, Anjal, uh, today is the Earth Day, which is uh, dedicated to raise uh, awareness amongst our people about 
uh, various environmental uh, challenges uh, that is faced uh, by the planet. Uh, coincidentally, President Biden has also convened uh, the leaders summit on climate today and all eyes are on the commitments that, that uh, could be announced uh, just before the COP26 uh, in November this year. The UN Food System Summit is also happening later this year. So at uh, such a juncture, a discussion on implications of climate change on agriculture is indeed very apt. And I wish to compliment uh, the ISB and the Deputy High Commission, British Deputy High Commission for this. Uh, judges uh, just spoke about uh, various dimensions around climate change and agriculture. And uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Flaherty also uh, talked about uh, the broader global uh, policy arena. Uh, let me elaborate how climate change is impacting uh, the agriculture sector in India. Uh, uh, even though uh, the growth story of Indian agriculture since the onset of Green Revolution has been very impressive, we have the additional chief secretaries of this particular department from uh, Haryana and Punjab, the seat of Green Revolution in our country. Uh, but the impact of climate change on agriculture could lead to food security problems and uh, may also threaten the livelihoods of millions uh, in India. Uh, the frequent occurrences of natural disasters like flood, drought, storms, hails, cyclones, uh, etc. have led to severe hardships and, and, and farm distress in the past. Uh, there is now scientific consensus uh, that all these increasing weather variabilities and worsening extremes are due to climate change and which is impacting the agriculture sector more and more adversely. Uh, Anjil, uh, then what could be the main implications of uh, climate change on Indian agriculture? Let me try to uh, spell out a few of them. First, uh, the impact on the food production. Uh, uh, research studies have predicted uh, the trend that there could be an agricultural decline with climate change. I can cite few examples. Uh, studies uh, carried out by the Indian Agricultural Research Institute have indicated the possibility of a loss of 4 to 5 million metric tons in wheat production with every rise of 1 degree centigrade temperature. There are copious uh, other examples from uh, various other parts of the country. I'm just citing this uh, particular example. Second, uh, quality of the food grains. Uh, the quality of grains in many crops uh, significantly gets uh, affected by temperature and carbon dioxide. I wish to take a few examples. Uh, research has shown that the decline in grain protein content in cereals could partly be related to increased uh, carbon dioxide concentration and temperature. Uh, there are also reports of quality of basmati rice, which is uh, very much cultiv cultivated in huge tract in Haryana and Punjab. Uh, their quality could be adversely impacted due to temperature increase beyond an optimum level. The third uh, impact could be on the pest and disease incidences. Uh, judges uh, mentioned about this. In any crop, the pest infestation or disease incidences, they are functions of ambient uh, temperature and humidity. Uh, so crop pest or the crop disease interactions will therefore change uh, significantly uh, in a changing climate. The commonest example is recent resurgence of many insect pests and the levels of rust, virulence and other diseases uh, in parts of India. The fourth impact that I, I see is the effect on cropping systems. Uh, extremes of weather variables uh, adversely affect the cropping systems. It's now an established uh, fact uh, that the monsoon onset is getting delayed in uh, past years uh, than the normal uh, date. I come from Odisha and I did a, personally, I did a study for my master's dissertation on this uh, variabilities. And I found that uh, the occurrence of very heavy rainfall events, increase in mean annual maximum temperature or decrease in mean uh, annual or monthly minimum temperature, they are very common these days. And as all of us know that uh, they greatly influence the growth pattern and productivity of many crops. Fifth, uh, Anjal, I would just like to touch upon the impact on allied agri sectors. Extreme weather events not only affect the crops, whether it is field crop or plantation, horticultural, uh, but also they adversely impact uh, the animal agriculture, fisheries and aquaculture, uh, both directly and indirectly. So to sum up, uh, climate change is perhaps the most extreme challenge agriculture in India and for that matter, the rest of the world is facing today and uh, has to deal with in future. Anjal, I stop here and come back when we discuss further, please. Thank you. Thanks, Arvind. A very interesting overview, uh, especially from the uh, uh, perspective from ICRISAT. And I know ICRISAT is one of the leading uh, 
research scientific scientific research institution uh, which has been um, you know working a lot tirelessly on these issues uh, we'll come back to you because i would have some questions and i'm sure participants will also have questions let me just go over to sumita uh, sumita let's just hear from uh, how are things on ground uh, especially from the states like haryana um, uh, so over to you sumita uh, good afternoon everyone greetings on earth day and uh, Earth Day is restore our Earth, which means that our strategies for uh, conservation have go beyond mitigation and adaptation, and be perhaps much larger in terms of restoration of natural resource systems. Uh, with that, uh, I'll come straight away to Haryana. Haryana is one of the most vibrant uh, agrarian economies in the country, and. Uh, Within Haryana, agriculture contributes about nine percent to our state GDP. It's also one of the most intensive agricultural systems. We have ninety-eight uh, percent of the cultural area that is actually cultivated, and the cropping intensity is a whopping one hundred and ninety-three percent. So, and uh, we also have uh, about eighty-five percent of our uh, cropped area which is irrigated, mainly by uh, tube well irrigation and some by canal irrigation. Now, and our uh, The main community is made up largely of uh, small and marginal farmers. They constitute about 67% of our total uh, farmers in the state, of, which is about 16 lakhs. So when we the uh, you know nurseries of the green revolution, of the front rankers or uh, big performers, as far as the green revolution is concerned. but it's it is time to wonder or to examine whether we have reached the stage of uh, diminishing returns as far as uh, the green revolution itself is concerned and uh, if i uh, to elaborate a little on haryana our own studies show that haryana would be looking at about uh, if we look at the short term that is up to the 20 we're looking at about Five degree Celsius increase in average mean temperatures, and as Arvind said, uh, one degree rise means a loss of production of four to five million tons. So the uh, of wheat. So the effect. Uh, one of uh, one of the the things that we are examining is that the effect uh, in the uh, short run is more likely to be manifest in the rubby crops, which we are already seeing for the last some years with the shortening uh, with the shortened ripening time for wheat. and and the fact that that itself leads to multiple problems as far as the rubby crops are concerned in the medium term we uh, our projections show that the rise would be between 2 to 4 degrees uh, celsius and that goes up to 5 to 6 in the longer term beyond that so, uh, the fact is that uh, the time to strategize and to implement these new uh, multi dimensional strategies is is not just today it's i think it would have should have been yesterday if we uh, if we look at the uh, impact of climate remember i mean i would say this not just for Russia, but for india or rather the the global south is that i mean as per all studies for wfp any study But the greatest impact of climate anomalies is experienced by those that are the poorest because they are heavily dependent on weather systems because they have access to less resources and far less capacity or technology to respond and if you sort of break down that further uh, the the impact of climate change would then be experienced disproportionately by the poor by small farmers and by women so i think these are so very important aspects that uh, no see uh, global agreements exist and has in fact trying to exceed this is something that the global community also needs to look at very seriously because the global south which is going to bear the greatest brunt of climate change has about 75% of the population and about 67 to 70% of that population is engaged in agriculture 
and as the most recent FAO report says that there are more than 20 countries that are looking at uh, that are going to be hunger hotspots uh, in, the, in the very near that was that is I think something that I wanted to flag as far as the global community and arena is concerned but back to Ariana we do have seen uh, some of the uh, impacts of this rice wheat rotation because that's what the green revolution essentially brought in paddy was uh, not a major crop in Haryana till uh, the green revolution and till increased irrigation happened whereas now it is the dominant kharif crop it has uh, you know all the other traditional crops of the kharif season that is the summer so sowing have uh, more or less been edged out by paddy and as a result, what are we seeing? We are seeing, uh, firstly, of course, a declining water table. And between 1974 and uh, June and tw June 2020, there was an 11 meter drop in the average water table in Haryana. Now, what is more interesting is between 1995 and 2020, there was an 11, uh, there was a 9.5 meter drop. So things were changing gradually, and then suddenly there has been this this almost uh, you know dramatic decline in water tables and this is something that um, i think i mean the state government is seized off and maybe later when we come back i'll share some of the initiatives that we are uh, we are you know taking up to address all these issues right now i'll just flag some of the concerns and i guess uh, they might be common to punjab also and then of course is the issue of groundwater pollution along with depletion is pollution because of increased fertilizer use, insecticide use, pesticide use. We're seeing a, a, a groundwater that is heavily polluted. There are nitric oxide, all kinds of pollutants. And, uh, it, you know, I mean, I was just, thanks to this uh, webinar, I also looked at some of the data. So in 1970-71, we were using about 14 kgs per hectare of uh, fertilizer use, which is now up to almost 220 kgs per hectare so again it's it's a very uh, dramatic and quantum jump and uh, we tend to see these as markers of progress that you're using more fertilizer or more pesticide whereas it should be the reverse perhaps if we look at uh, the earth as our biggest resource that we should be able to over time reduce their use instead of take these as markers of uh, uh, economic progress i mean that that's just uh, my view but i think it is time now to think along those lines. Uh, also, as, as mentioned by George, outbreak of all kinds of new variants of old diseases or pests, you know. Uh, so the disease that we're seeing on crop is particular to this wheat rice rotation. And therefore, it is more resistant, leading us back to more chemicals. So it is really a, a vicious cycle that is, uh, that is being perpetuated year after year. Crop residue management, we all know, particularly as far as the rice straw is concerned, huge uh, environmental pollution impacts, as well as a net nutrient negative uh, impact on the soil itself. And then there is the issue of soil health and land degradation. We're seeing increased alkalinity, salinity, degraded lands, and a generally very poor organic uh, matter in, in the soil, which was not the case earlier. Uh, please let me know when when my time is up. Okay. Because yeah, I because... actually, Subhita, I'll come back to you uh, because yes, uh, I'll, I'll so go is, I'll, I'll I'll a very interesting conversation. Areas of concern for us, and maybe we can then discuss strategies later. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'll come back to you. It's interesting conversation. So let me just quickly go over to Anirudh now um, to just get some views from Punjab, and then we'll come back to the discussion. There are a couple of questions that have come up. So over to you, Anirudh. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Anjil. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Guru, my friend from ISP and ISP for organizing this uh, very topical uh, webinar. And uh, happy Earth Day, everyone. Uh, well, uh, I, I think what uh, I can only echo what uh, my friend and uh, uh, batchmate Sumita just talked about, the issues that plague Haryana. I mean, it's, it's the same because essentially we are, we are the same uh, geographical uh, uh, zone. Uh, you see, I mean, if, if anybody ever had any doubts about uh, whether climate change was happening or not, because we did have uh, some eminent people uh, putting a question mark on this aspect itself uh, till recently. Uh, just look at the weather conditions today. 
I mean, we in Chandigarh are experiencing 2719. I mean, uh, we, we all are sitting here. This is unheard of. Uh, end of April. This, this is not the temperature that uh, is supposed to be there when wheat harvesting is in full swing. And actually, uh, as I was going through some of the data that was uh, trickling in the morning about our crop cutting experiments uh, for wheat harvest, we are seeing actually a drop in wheat productivity this year, uh, vis-a-vis last year. And the reason for that is uh, very simple. I mean, you see, for, for, for the wheat to have a bountiful crop, there are two times, two occasions when you really need some good uh, 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 water supply, uh, I mean, preferably rainfall, but otherwise irrigation. One is sometimes during the close of uh, uh, February and then uh, sometimes during the middle of March or the third week of March. Now, both these uh, uh, time periods, we had dry spells. And the result of that is that it has led to a loss in productivity of wheat. And the second point that uh, was also mentioned and uh, Arvind was mentioning about it is it also leads to an issue of quality. And uh, in parts of in, uh, Punjab, as we are procuring, uh, uh, carrying out the uh, 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 wheat procurement at the minimum support price, the problem that we are uh, also experiencing is shriveled grain. Now, the shriveled grain essentially is because of lack of moisture. And this uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, is, is enough evidence of uh, climate change. Now, uh, you see, uh, we, 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 I, I was looking through again, as Sumita was saying, I mean, one, one tends to go uh, and look back at some of the key data whenever you are looking at some of these events uh, like, like this webinar. And you'll be surprised to know I was, uh, I was informed that, you know, we had snowfall in Pathankot sometimes in 2011. And uh, 2019 was a very uh, interesting year for us because in Ludhiana in December, we had the monthly average of maximum temperature, which was the lowest in the last two years. But at the same time, we, we experienced rainfall in the same year, which was much in excess, almost 50% in excess of what Ludhiana experiences. So you have low temperatures, you have higher rainfall. Now, now this is, and then you have uh, extremely dry spells as well. Uh, studies really have indicated that not only is the temperature increasing, but more importantly, the sunshine hours are going down in parts of Punjab. Now that's again, very, very important. And this uh, leads to a loss in productivity. It leads to an issues of uh, quality of grain and ultimately has an impact on the livelihoods of farmers. And uh, People may not believe it, you know, but uh, Sumita is absolutely right when she said that 70% uh, of our farmers are small and marginal in Punjab and Haryana. I mean, prosperity did come through the Green Revolution, but then, uh, you know, it has uh, it, it has been uh, brought about by the hard work of these small and marginal farmers. Of course, what has also happened is, is that paddy was never the dominant crop of this region. You see, yeah. Uh, yeah. what it has meant is that for the sake of the food security of the nation, this part of the country has pumped out and exported its groundwater. Now, we have actually exported our groundwater to other parts of the state. I mean, people don't, you see, the point is, uh, as, 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 uh, as, as a race, uh, human race, we, we, we people don't feel obliged. So when, when the country was growing hungry, uh, everybody was looking at Punjab and Rana. Today, people say, you know, forget about these states, you know, uh, there they are enough who have raised their hands, but then it's fine. I mean, uh, today, I think Arvind has heard me say this uh, quite often, but today, there are parts of the uh, country, Madhya Pradesh, uh, for example, for wheat and Chhattisgarh, Odisha, Bihar, Bengal, for rice, who are contributing now. And perhaps it's time for Punjab and Haryana to look differently. But yeah. you see, it I is... Did, I, I'm sorry, I have to just stop you here. Yeah, go ahead. Give me a minute to conclude my point, uh, uh, Anjal, because I'm sure you've called me to listen to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, you see, the point is that... Uh, the uh, the the crops of wheat and paddy are also the most uh, climb tough and hardy crops. I mean, they are the ones which are resistant. I mean, you you talk to a farmer if you want to grow pulses, you want to grow uh, oil seeds. They are not uh, resistant to uh, vagaries of climate as a paddy is. So that's also a key issue. Well, since you've interrupted me now, so I'll stop here. Uh, We'll come back. It's a very interesting conversation, both. Uh, and uh, I really value um, Anirudh, yours and Sumita's interjections because uh, you guys have from the ground and also the things coming up. But there are a lot of questions pouring in. So as moderator, my uh, responsibility is to direct those questions back to you all because I think we will be 
participatory. So let me just go over to, uh, there's a question from Amit Kumar and I'll pass this on to George. Uh, there's a question which is asking about uh, genetically modified crops. Uh, how is it resistant to the certain diseases uh, um, and has low health benefits to the human? So do you think this option could be there um, as solution part of it? George, over to you. For me, Anjan. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Well, I just answered. I was checking the the Q and A chat, so I thought. Uh, we, we yeah, you did answer, answer, but I think for the larger public, it's good to just uh, yeah, yeah. publicly as well. I mean, about genetically modified organisms, um, there are two issues. There is, of course, the the issue of of health and pollution, and there's the issue of of productivity, and. Um, the um, the element you know so more socio political element of who makes the these uh, improved varieties and for whom no who do they benefit so for example let's take an example roundup ready corn right so glyphosate resistant corn rr um it is a technological improvement that is uh, very interesting on a scientific level and intellectual development uh, on the other hand, it's a plant that is it's a crop that is resistant to to a, a, a high toxic pollutant, which is has proven to be um, uh, inducing cancer in many in many pop in in a, in, a, in a large part of population. So I think this is a first problem. The other problem is uh, in terms of uh, water pollution and soil soil pollution and loss of um, soil biodiversity and um, and then there's the issue of you know okay so so it resists uh, glyphosate but you know corn traditionally in Mexico where 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 it's native from is not grown by itself uh, it's not in monoculture it's actually a polyculture it's called the three sisters no the milpa system which includes corn as a as a main feature pumpkin and beans and sometimes also uh, uh, sweet pepper so. This is the thing, like how how are we transforming, no, and shifting, going from from something that is high knowledge intensive, and uh, and and with many very much interactions in in terms of biology towards something that is completely uh, technological based, no, in this case herbicide is technology, and and the GM crop itself uh, to replace the functions that nature already gives us. So I mean, the call is not necessarily to you know, it's not that I'm in favor or against particularly, it's just that we need to be critical about these technologies. Who do they serve and what are they for? Yeah, thanks, Georges. Uh, Ken, there is a question for you if you are, uh, um, if you could put on your video. Uh, okay, I'll come back to you, Ken. Hello. Okay. Yeah, the question to you is, um, uh, is um, about green agriculture. So uh, uh, this is coming from Gurpeet Singh and um, uh, the question is how, whether green agriculture is increasing productivity. What is your view on this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the great things about um, green technology is that it's it's good for the environment, but it's also um, often very good for farmers' profits. Um, so I mentioned um, in my introduction that increasingly in the UK, farmers are using small robots um, to cultivate the uh, fields rather than um, using big tractors. That uses less fuel, less diesel. Um, and the fact of using less diesel, of course, means there's fewer emissions, but it also reduces costs overall in the longer term um, for farmers. Likewise, um, by targeting um, uh, your use of fertilizers or your use of um, pesticides, um, you're able to use less of both, um, which is better for the environment. But it also means um, that the farmer is saving. So, and we recognize that there are obstacles to use of these technologies um, because often they are new and sometimes they're expensive and so forth. Um, so that's a big part um, of our cooperation with India is trying to ensure that we're sharing um, technologies and making sure that we're building more sustainable agriculture worldwide. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Very interesting. Uh, there's a question by Madhu Mishra, and I'll uh, probably request uh, Abhin the party to answer this question. It's on ag agro agroforestry. Uh, could we use agroforestry as a as a means to mitigate climate change? Uh, Abhin, the uh, yes, uh, they can be taken as uh, one of the very prominent uh, pathways to mitigate uh, uh, climate change impacts in agriculture sector. In fact, uh, in the BUR, the biennial update report, you are 
an expert on climate change. So the BUR submitted by India to the UNFCC, uh, in fact, it is one of uh, the pathways which has been uh, mentioned there. So agroforestry, yes, there are many other ways. In fact, the National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture as a part of uh, the NAPCC, uh, that also includes agroforestry as a very major uh, mitigation uh, pathway. Yeah. Okay. There's another question which is on geotagging. Uh, let me see who, who wants to answer this. So the question is by Rahul Prakash and he's say, asking uh, could geographical integrated indi indicated tag, uh, GI tag crop help reduce the GSG emission? For example, uh, Kalamantak rice is a, a very old and traditional paddy crop naturally cultivated for the thousands of years. Rice cultivation is the highest contribution of GHG emission. I'm not sure who's uh, who wants to answer. Yes. Uh, can I? Can I? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Anjal. In fact, uh, I come from Odisha, and many traditional uh, land races also uh, are there in uh, Odisha. And in fact, uh, Odisha, the Jaipur tract of Odisha is considered as the secondary origin of rice uh, crop. Just for the information of the audience. Uh, so, and I, I entirely agree that, uh, the, in fact, you know, Angel, that agroecological approaches are, in fact, uh, suggested uh, to, for uh, mitigation options in agriculture sector. But unfortunately, uh, the the um, and, uh, the the yield of these uh, GI tagged crops uh, uh, that would be very low. So the minimum support price for a GI tagged uh, crop and and the high league varieties of Haryana or Punjab they are the same so and so we have to find a premium niche market for such uh, produce but they are definitely uh, good candidates for uh, mitigation options thank you thanks Anirudh there's a question for you uh, and uh, coming to and there are two questions both for Sumita and um, uh, Anirudh but I'll first go to Amir Anirudh this is a direct question to you is uh, uh, about deficient water in uh, Punjab uh, and uh, giving the groundwater situation availability and the free power to the tube wells the decrease in yield is due to land being uh, you know um, uh, yeah so there, there has been an impact actually on the um, uh, groundwater de decline with the with the water availability for people so what is your view on this one is the question well uh, no denying the fact that there are the decrease in productivity is of course due to uh, the um, i mean monocropping excessive use of fertilizers and without uh, allowing the uh, soil to regenerate itself is certainly uh, responsible for uh, decreased levels of productivity and to add to it also is the uh, is the way that uh, we uh, we uh, cultivate paddy now the fact that uh, the, the the puddling of uh, 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 technique that we use for, for paddy cultivation transplantation itself uh, uh, inhibits the percolation of uh, and recharge of uh, groundwater so I think one thing that we are doing is we've been uh, uh, focusing a lot on direct seeding of rice technology. And uh, last year we were able to push it to, and actually it was, I mean, the COVID situation was some sort of a blessing in disguise for us because uh, once we found, realized that the uh, labor, the which is generally used for transplantation of uh, paddy uh, has, has returned to uh, parts of uh, other parts of the country, the farmer really had not much, didn't have much choice. So uh we when we propagated dsr uh, the direct seeding of rice uh, it was popular and we were able to uh, bring in about 20 percent of our area under uh, dsr this year we are uh, pretty ambitious we are targeting 50 percent let's see uh, how much we uh, we achieve so that is one way to conserve uh, groundwater of course there are uh, certain uh, people soil scientists who might uh, argue you know that it's only uh, good for uh, hard soils and it's not very good for sandy soils. That's that's fine. I'm sure the farmer is, uh, you know, aware of these. And uh, we are also focusing only on those kind of soil varieties. So we are doing uh, something on uh, conservation of groundwater as well. Thanks. Uh, there's uh, another question from Aditya Dar uh, for both of you, actually. Uh, but I'll first go over to uh, uh, Sumita and then I'll come back to you again. And the uh, question is, uh, uh, could you talk about the initiatives taken by both Punjab and Haryana government to conserve groundwater and can a market-based trading platform in water rights be a solution or are there any other alternative that you have on board? So first over to Sumita and then come to, I'll come to this. Sumita, over to you. Actually, our, uh, our strategy is to go for the uh, with the market. 
future with that uh, broad uh, and we have a number of sub components or sub programs that we have initiated on the ground which means that we have what is smart agriculture what is smart carbon smart nutrient smart and uh, it smart knowledge smart regarding water conservation as you know that adi is a water guzzler and wheat in any case is a crop that is geographically climatically suitable for this area so our focus therefore is more on uh, kharif that is diversify crop diversification in the kharif system and uh, for that last year uh, our chief minister has announced a scheme uh, specifically for crop diversification which is called mera pani meri virasat so to encourage people to view water as uh, as an asset as something that is part of their heritage which they must pass on to the next generation so it is also putting uh, that mindset we think they are giving 7000 rupees per acre as incentive for crop diversification and since last year was the first year of this scheme i mean i'm happy to report that we uh, managed to cover about 80000 acres with crop with under this scheme in diversified cropping which essentially means that farmers moved away from paddy to other crops and were incentivized i would uh, stress here that you know one very important factor i don't know if i'm clear my voice is i don't know if it's clear. yeah the slight echo um, echo is there but okay we must keep in mind the economic signaling that wants to go for the wheat paddy rotation you have the anirudh said they are very stable crops so the farmer knows he will get a certain produce get a certain price at produce in the market unless we put in place a system of alternative economic signals that incentivize other crops equally if not better the farmer is not going to diversify that's common sense you and i if we are going to crop we wouldn't change unless there was a strong enough economic basis too so the idea behind in this one टेक्निकल टीम लुक इन टू इट बिफोर आई गो टू अनु So Anurudh, very quickly, uh, your side, uh, is there any uh, uh, solution that you see, especially the market-based solution for water rights uh, to fix the environment uh, groundwater issue? Uh, Anjali, you are you are asking a very very uh, sensitive yes. uh, question uh, because uh, this is you know, question asked by Aditya. So yeah. I know I, I know Aditya. Aditya works. Uh, uh, I mean, we are working together with Aditya on a lot of issues. So uh, this is some kind of an insider trading. <laughs> <laughs> but well let me share something we are thinking on those lines and uh, we have recently set up the punjab state groundwater uh, regulatory and development authority and the state water regulatory and development authority is looking at a possible scheme where we are trying to you see one thing is that out of the 150 odd blocks in punjab 127 are almost to the dark zone so if you want to set up industry it is very difficult to extract groundwater and set up industry so what we are trying to see is is there a trade off that we can engage between a diversification of less water guzzling crops and the setting up of an industry so i we are working on that as a concept uh, but we are also mindful of the fact that it's a politically sensitive topic we are right in the middle of now in the election year difficult for any government to take a, a decision but uh, with the uh, groundwater regulatory authority we are working on that and hopefully uh, by by the end of the year we should be coming to something but i must also mention here that already we are we are uh, we have implemented a pani bachao paisa kamao scheme where uh, 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 we are we are charging the farmers uh, but at the same time we are incentivizing them to consume less groundwater so so uh, i i don't think we have enough time to discuss that scheme but that's something that is already in yeah. thanks so much um, uh, there are a lot of questions actually so i request responses which is slightly shorter so that we can cover most of the um, uh, questions in next 15 minutes uh, let me just go over to george's uh, george's there's a question on um, increasing productivity i mean one side this is from um, you know uh, that you have in 
while we have to activity to feed the growing population. But at the same time, when you have more and more of agriculture, it contributes to climate change. So this kind of a dichotomous relationship. How do we solve this riddle? This is from thank you, Anjal. Person. That's a really yeah. interesting question. So if I rephrase, it's the the idea that uh, we need food, but uh, we need food in a way that doesn't harm the environment, and on the other hand, uh, mitigates the, the the harmful effects of of big agriculture, right? So yeah, somebody mentioned agroforestry. That's that's a, a practice that can be implemented uh, very nicely. I just want to make a point here: uh, the difference between practices, you know, agroecological practices and agroecological principles. Um, these principles of design, which I mentioned briefly: diversity, recycling, uh, synergies, more interactions, and uh, productive efficiency, are are design principles that can be implemented uh, anywhere in the world that they are universal, whether it's in India or the UK or the Caribbean or Africa, the principles remain the same. What's different is the, the particular practices and the practices that we implement depend very much on the objective and the possibilities of the, of the people who are implementing them, right? So the idea is that how can we make more eco-friendly uh, farming systems is by understanding the ecosystems that we have around us by taking advantage of this diversity, whether it's uh, agrobiodiversity, so crops, or wild diversity in order, for example, to produce biomass and protect the soil, to make mulch and use less water and simultaneously restore organic matter. Um, so this, uh, this, 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 this um, importance of the design, really. And there is a transition no, towards agroecological food systems, and I will uh, make a point briefly, is that you have, I mean, there's a professor in California, Gleisman, Steve I think we have lost uh, George's in between. So okay. let me just go a quick we'll to, uh, Arpinda. Yeah, George's, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, I, we lost you in between. So. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Um, so, so I go back to the levels, not this transition towards our ecological food system, just to finish my, my answer. Yeah. Um, the first level, level zero, let's say, is conventional agriculture, toxic agriculture, which uses uh, uh, pesticides, which is uh, very oversimplified. Then level one is uh, the best use of conventional input. So, for example, if we have to use fertilizer or herbicide, don't use it before it rains so that the, the salts can, can remain and be useful for the crops. Level two is the process of detoxification or input substitution, also known as organic certification, for example, you know, where we still use monocultures, but we are re replacing toxic inputs by uh, non-toxic inputs. The third level, which is the one I'm passionate about and the, what the, the something I want to share, is the redesign how to redesign and rethink these systems. And it can be small scale, but it can also be large scale. And the principles of agroecology are useful for, for designing this. Um, last thing is you have an example, a very useful example in, the, in, the, in India, which is the zero natural, the zero budget natural farming, ZNBF, ZBNF, that sets examples from farmer innovations that upscale you know, climate mitigation strategies and resource conservation strategies. Thank you, Anjali. Thanks. Uh, Arvinda, there are two questions that just come and I think then direct them to you. First is by Jeevan Chandra and is asking about the dry land agriculture and they are facing severe climate change issues. So what could the, those issues be and how do we in, enhance the sustainability uh, of the system? That's number one. And the second question is about uh, uh, the, um, you know, uh, uh, this question is, uh, Okay, let me just go over to this. Uh, okay, first answer this question and I'll locate the second question. This is mother okay. question. Okay, climate resilience in drylands. It's a very uh, good question. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the vagaries of the weather, the weather variabilities, they are more pronounced in the dryland areas uh, than in the irrigated tracts of Haryana or Punjab. Uh, we heard both the additional chief secretary saying that uh, the cropping intensity is uh, almost uh, 200 percentage. And on uh, and and also the irrigation coverage is more than 95 percentage. 
so so the weather variability is more pronounced in the dryland areas but uh, there are technologies which uh, could literally be applied there uh, and specific technologies and practices are available George has just mentioned about the natural farming techniques wherever uh, possible. There are many agroecological approaches which are available. I'll just give you a simple example. If somebody is cultivating paddy in an upland, they can very well switch over to sorghum or other millet crops, which will be uh, having less water footprints and also would give better returns to the farmers. So there are technologies uh, available and uh, we have to contextually kind of uh, take uh, those uh, advisories uh, for the farmers. The yeah, thanks so much. The second question is Medha Mula, and she's asking about the uh, you know issue of climate smart agriculture. And I know Ikrisat has been doing a lot of work on that one. So uh, would that be a solution uh, to uh, the problem that we're facing? So what would be your views on that? Yes, I entirely agree that the climate smart agriculture uh, practices and technologies would uh, be very meaningful solutions to the problems encountered. But uh, there are some structural or the policy issues. Uh, I, I would just say that uh, the, the rational uh, is not yet appreciated by everyone, uh, more so at the down uh, level of governance. For example, I mean, maybe the top levels of bureaucracy, they might be aware about this, but uh, at the lower level of governance, for example, a serpent at the village level, he would not be or she would not be aware and they would not uh, kind of uh, implement uh, schemes or practice. NREGS is available throughout our country. So if a Sarpanch or a Panchayati Raj representative takes off climate proofing structures in his or her area, that could be a very good practice. Watershed approach is often suggested. There are many other technologies which are available. Thanks so much. So Mita, there's, you talked about the marginal farmers and there's a question here about land holding uh, you know, of, of uh, small farmers and could there could there be a way in which one can pool in the land so that the risk is spread? This is why uh, one of the researchers here was asking this question. Yeah. This is by Srikant. Yeah. Srikant. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, land pooling, or you know, if you look at the earlier cooperative movement, that's essentially what it was. And uh, as history or experience has shown us that agricultural cooperative societies have more or less been controlled by one or two people and have been rather a euphemism for uh, the earlier uh, zamindari system or whatever it might have been <clears throat> but on the other hand we have a couple of uh, things that we can do and which we are doing <clears throat> one is that uh, to ensure that the benefits of technology are available to the small and marginal farmers we have taken up custom hiring centers in a very big way. So where farm mechanization is concerned, we all know that you need a certain a size of holding for a particular machine, whether it's a tractor or whatever have you, to be viable and economic sense. That's why we have, uh, you know, given a very substantial assistance to um, uh, custom hiring centers. There are more than 5,000 custom hiring centers operational in Haryana. And uh, that's one way of making latest technology available. The other thing is we've been promoting horticulture in a very big way uh, with very, very substantial uh, awareness, training and uh, subsidies. Now, horticulture, as we know, works best on smaller holdings because it is a more intensive uh, agronomic practice than your regular agriculture. So in that's and in fact, horticulture in Haryana has done exceedingly well also. We have leveraged our uh, locational advantage of being around the NCR, whether it is uh, uh, all kinds of vegetables, exotic vegetables, mushrooms, beekeeping. We are taking an integra integrated farming system, a system approach to promote horticulture and other such crops. So I think these together would help in uh, increasing farmer incomes for small and marginal farmers. Very interesting point. Yeah, I, I'll come back to you, Anruddha. I have two questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, Arvind, I'll come back to you. And Ruth, I have two questions for you. Um, one is uh, about uh, the agro, uh, the uh, Punjab's policy on agro diversity. Um, what is it doing? Uh, and second question is about uh, the uh, conservation uh, policies in uh, agriculture. So, if you there's a dichotomy, if you really want to go for say, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, sustainable agriculture, would it mean that the production will be lesser than what it was before? So, how do we? compromise on that one. So over to you, Anruth, and I'll come to, come to you, Arvinda. You're muted, uh, Arvinda. Yeah. 
Any uh, new sorry, sorry. Uh, thanks, Anjal. Uh, I'll, I'll take your uh, second question first. And on uh, sustainable agriculture. No, I don't think uh, sustainable agriculture uh, goes against the concept of prosperity. In fact, you see, uh, what we've been now uh, talking about in Punjab is that there was a time when it was about production, productivity, food security of the country. Now, as I said, others have raised their hand. So we are now going to talk about sustainable agriculture and farmers' prosperity. Let's look at ourselves because uh, plateauing agricultural incomes are certainly not good for the uh, farming community in general. So we are pushing a lot on sustainable agriculture, and that brings me to your first part, which is on agro diversity. Now, diversification is easier said than done. You know, I, I've been saying that everybody comes and tells me what to do. I mean, diversify agriculture. The issue is how to do it. You know, the, the what is a simple part. The how is the difficult one. Now, uh, it took us two decades to go through the green revolution. There were institutional reforms, there were institutional buildings, and then there was technology and a lot of other things. On diversification here, a uh, lot of people say, let's switch to maize. Let, somebody says, let's switch to horticulture. What we are doing is now in Punjab is we are looking at diversification as a multi-pronged approach. So we are going to give the farm an option for maize, for horticulture, for seed production, for uh, allied activities. Now, these are the kind of things that we are looking at. And simultaneously, we are kind of also pushing in for uh, uh, looking at technologies to conserve groundwater. We are working together with Becrot, uh, which is the Israeli uh, uh, utility on uh, water conservation. Uh, they've done some good pilots for us, and we hope to replicate them. So it's, it's not something that will happen overnight, but uh, slowly and surely we are making progress. Thanks so much. Uh, over to you, Arvinda. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Anjal. I just wanted to add to what Samita ma'am just told about the land issue. That's a very structural issue and needs a lot of policy focus. Uh, in fact, as per the last uh, agri census five years ago, uh, the land holding size of any average agriculture household is only 1.08 hectares in our country, which is very small. Uh, but then how do we uh, kind of uh, to offset the scale disadvantage, how could we bring the smallholders together? Land leasing is often uh, suggested. And unfortunately, I can take example. Uh, I think Anjul Sar will allow me to uh, take example of Punjab. In Punjab, land leasing is banned. But in Punjab, the land uh, leasing is as high as 30 to 40 percentage by many studies. So in many uh, many states, in my state of Odisha also it is banned, but at least the government gives uh, benefits to lessee uh, cultivators or the sharecroppers. So how do we address this also will kind of uh, add, uh, impact uh, the climate and the local uh, uh, agriculture production scenario. Thanks Thank so you. much. Yeah, so we're almost Anjal, coming to the end of our program. Anjal, let me, let me yes, just come yes, yes, and uh, let me just come in for a for a second here, uh, Arvin. It's not banned. Land leasing is not banned. There is a convoluted issue behind it. Probably you need another webinar to uh, talk about it. But it's not banned. That's the technical part of it. But it <laughs> yeah. uh, perhaps it is more than forty percent also. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, so we are just coming to the fag in the program. Sorry, there are a lot of questions, but I could not um, take it in the interest of time. I have to just get into the closing remark from each one of you. Um, uh, I'll start with Sumita um, uh, and all of you just remember there are some of questions probably uh, probably you can just uh, when you're closing you may try to reflect on this one. One question is about the COVID and the responses that we have and you know whether COVID issues also very close related with uh, climate change issues. Uh, just your reflection as you're closing. Second part is um, about the uh, net zero uh, you know issue that we have been discussing now this is a new buzzword which has come in the climate sector. So um, is net zero possible in agriculture uh, is, um, uh, is the question. So just reflect upon it plus your own closing remark and please limit it to probably one minute uh, of your remark. So I'll just go over to Sumita uh, followed by Anirudh Georges and then close with Arvinda. Sumita over to you. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Well, actually, as it turns out, time has turned out to be very short. But as I mentioned that we are in Haryana are going forward to tackle the impacts of climate change on agriculture with a um, uh, you know, multi-dimensional uh, climate smart agriculture approach within which we have uh, subcomponents. And uh, uh, I would just like to add that in those subcomponents, we are definitely looking at soil and water health in a, in a very big way. 
uh, we are taking that forward. Apart from all the other things I've already mentioned, I don't want to repeat horticulture, integrated approach. Awareness uh, generation is a huge part of this. I've already touched upon the economic signaling and uh, price points. And the last thing I'll touch upon is that uh, crop residue management, which also has uh, very big implications, especially for NCR, and it's a global, it's a, it's a yearly problem. So, which is also something that we are, uh, you know, there was a point about geotagging. So we are using a three-pronged approach, awareness generation, uh, satellite tracking of each and every uh, farm fire as it occurs in real time, and uh, uh, combining to put the technologies for crop residue management. And all that has given us uh, already uh, very good results. Uh, the farm fire incidence as far as Haryana goes, is down by almost 15% in the last uh, over the last one and a half years. So as I said, it's it's a, a number of things that need to be done uh, simultaneously and uh, not in silos. And uh, that's what we are trying to do. Thanks, Somita. And it's very interesting uh, way you're summarizing, and also the uh, you know uh, the new innovations which is coming on from Haryana is interesting. Then we just go over to George's uh, George's your closing remark. Thank you. Thank you for, for having us here, sharing some ideas and sharing experiences. Um, yeah, I, 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 my, my closing message is to look at farmer innovations as, a, as a, the key to, to better production and, and, and climate mitigation. Farmers have uh, techniques, they have knowledge, and they also have the, the will and the objective of, of producing for the environment and, and, and better, right? There is no, there is no, the, it doesn't make sense that a farmer wants to harm the environment that they're using to produce their own livelihood. So that's my, my message. Thank you again. And hopefully we see each other at some other point in life. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. It's interesting uh, discussions. I'll, I'll go over to Anirudh first. Anirudh, over to you, uh, your closing uh, observations, remarks, anything way forward. Thanks, Anjil. And I think I, I, I can only echo what George just mentioned and Sumita uh, earlier. I mean, George talked about livelihoods and uh, uh, yes, you see, when we are talking about climate change and agriculture, we are talking about livelihoods of people. You see, when you talk about reducing emissions uh, uh, from automobiles, uh, they are luxuries that we are talking of for, for people. I mean, they may be connected to livelihoods, but it's not at the same extent and level as you are talking about in agriculture. So uh, uh, when, you are, when we are talking about anything related to agriculture, we must uh, remember that it has an impact on millions and millions of uh, livelihoods. The second point that Sumita also mentioned was that we cannot work in silos. I mean, agriculture has to be an integrated approach. I mean, and this is something that we are now working at. And as I mentioned, we are looking at the mantra today for us is sustainable agriculture and farmers prosperity, because that's the way we are looking at uh, the, the entire sector. And when I talk about sustainability, it's uh, talking about soil health, it's talking about our groundwater resources, and it's also talking about air pollution. Of course, uh, I, I mentioned it to the air, uh, uh, the, the Commission on Air Quality Management for NCR also, that we are responsible only for 45 days of your poor quality, and that in some way. Uh, 325 days, uh, 320 days of the year, you yourself are responsible, so please look at it. Don't blame us for everything that happens in those 45 days. Uh, so, so again, uh, Guru, you need to organize a separate webinar on uh, uh, CRM itself. Uh, so thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, being on this webinar and uh, learned a lot uh, uh, from colleagues. Thanks, thank so Anirudh. Thank you. Uh, let me just go to Arvinda, your closing remark. Arvinda. Thanks, Anjal. Uh, uh, let me also summarize that uh, the net zero emissions, at least in agriculture sector, is very much possible through effective uh, mitigation measures and appropriate adaptation technologies. I could just suggest in the passing uh, few, uh, we must uh, promote sustainable technologies and practices which have less uh, ecological footprints. Number two, we must go for crop diversification in those landscapes where they are not sustainable. And we must also promote consumer awareness for nutritious food products that will again link to uh, sustainable agri-food production systems. Thanks again, Anjal, for this opportunity. Thank you so much. I think we had a very enriched discussion today. I'll dare not to summarize anything because we had done a huge uh, in terms of uh, um, you know in terms of issues and tackling we diagnosed the problem we also looked at the solution space and some two very good into uh, into interjections came from haryana and punjab especially from the innovations which is happening on ground how do we tackle the issues that that talked about the uh, you know issues uh, at the uh, uh, level of india in terms of how 
especially dryland agriculture and the sustainability part of it. Uh, George, thanks so much. Uh, you also looked into the uh, issues. Thank you so much, uh, uh, and also shared your experience from the other parts of the global south. And uh, we see a lot of commonalities uh, of the deal problem that we are dealing with. And we also looked into the solution space. Um, I think there's a thing that shows, Guru, that uh, you know we uh, this uh, this is a hot topic. Uh, and when time is short, I couldn't um, at least half the question. I just could managed to take it um, it was so interesting so um, uh, probably we could interact more and then uh, take this forward uh, over to you guru to close this thank you so much and thanks everyone for your really interesting uh, introductions and uh, observations participate thank you so much thank you i'll just keep it very short thank you very much anjal first of all for moderating this uh, very interesting session it's uh, never easy when you have such a heavyweight panel uh, you know and i think you did a very good job especially given that you have to balance their views and also balance the audience uh, sort of interest in wanting to uh, ask them questions uh, i want to thank you for that i want to thank uh, shri anrut tiwari as always uh, your support to isb and your partnership is very valued thank you very much sir uh, dr sumita mishra thank you so much for uh, being part of this panel and uh, we, you know you've just stepped into this role uh, i think a month or two now we look forward to uh, engaging with you uh, given that there's a bunch of our faculty who have a deep interest in agriculture uh, space and we're doing some work with uh, mr tiwari in punjab and uh, given that we are here we'd love to sort of uh, do some work with you as well in haryana uh, thank you so much for uh, your time this afternoon uh, dr pardi uh, again i guess like many people uh, all of us uh, first get exposed to you on twitter and then get the benefit of your in person hospitality uh, so this is i am i'm no exception to that so thank you so much uh, for your uh, you know uh, participation this afternoon uh, in this panel and also sharing your insights uh, dr george felix thank you so much for joining us from uh, uk uh, you know it's always uh, good to have an international perspective and especially so given that this is a event in partnership with the british uh, deputy high commission and i want to thank ambassador ken of lady for his uh, remarks uh, at the beginning and also I'm not sure if he's still on the call but i like to sort of you know just put out a thing out there for him that given that he has the role for you know as the regional ambassador for south asia we can count on us and I, i include i take the liberty of including everybody here on this panel uh, you know on how to achieve some of his goals in the run up to cop 26 it's a common vision that all of us are deeply invested in and i know that uh, both the states and ecrisat and everybody else has similar sort of you know uh, common goals to achieve as well uh, i want to also mention uh, and thank you to uh, deputy high commissioner carolyn rovet who's a dhc here in chandigarh for her initiative and partnership and madhu from the uh, dhc for her uh, help and support in making this uh, possible and my team members as well thank you so much everyone to our audience uh, thank you as always for joining in uh, i uh, you know when when someone like the additional chief secretary says guru you should organize one more this one more of this i don't take it as a suggestion i i actually take it as an order so we'll work on it and try and organize more <laughs> uh, uh, so we will uh, you know and we look forward to your participation in all these things as we go forward thank you so much have thanks a nice everyone day. thanks bye bye yeah, thank you so much thanks, thanks.